Hi everyone, in this video we are going to prove an interesting property of the parabola, which is that if you have a parabola shaped mirror, then any ray which comes in towards the mirror parallel to the axis of symmetry, which in this diagram is the x-axis, then the ray will be reflected in such a way that it passes through the focus of the parabola. I don't want to get too deeply into the geometrical definition um, of the parabola in this video, so all I'm going to say about what the focus is, is that if you have a curve with equation y squared equals 4ax, where a is a constant, then it looks something like the curve that I've sketched uh, on these axes here, and the focus is this special point along the x-axis with an x-coordinate of a, the same a that appears in the equation of the parabola. So as a first step in the proof, let's draw on the ray that we were describing earlier. You can imagine this as being like a light ray coming in from x equals infinity. Um, and we said it has to be parallel to the x-axis. So that incoming ray is going to look something like this, trying to make it horizontal. Uh, I'm going to draw an arrow going to the left to show that we can imagine that ray coming in um, from infinity. And so what the theorem that we're trying to prove says uh, is that that ray should be reflected in such a way that it goes through the focus. I'm drawing that in red because technically we don't know whether that's true yet, right? Because we haven't proved the theorem. So I'm going to draw a... Uh, an arrow so it's reflecting like that and I'm going to put a question mark just to remind ourselves that that's what we're trying to prove like that it does indeed go to that point. So how do we know where reflected rays go in general? Well we have the law of reflection which says the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection and those two angles I just mentioned are both measured relative to the normal to the surface um, that the reflection is occurring from. So we should probably draw the normal on uh, that is, of course, a little vector which is perpendicular to the surface itself. In this case, maybe it looks something like that. Um, let's draw an arrow to show it's a vector, and I'm going to call it n hat uh, to show that it's been normalized. And to introduce a bit more notation, let's say that the direction of the incoming ray is given by a vector called d. So that would just be a vector pointing leftwards along the negative x-axis. And what we're trying to find um, in the first instance is the reflected vector, which I'm going to call d prime, um, which is basically the vector that gives you the direction of that red line on the diagram. So what I've just added to the screen is a sort of rotated and zoomed in version of the diagram at the point of interest where the reflection is occurring. We've got our vectors d and d prime incoming and outgoing. Uh, we've got our normal vector n. I've also added a tangent vector uh, t, which is simply just the vector which is perpendicular to n. And because we're going to do this all using vector notation, it doesn't matter that we've rotated around. I just think this makes it a little bit uh, easier to, uh, to visualize what's going on. So um, let's try to write d prime in terms of d. And the first step in doing that is going to be to split d into its components. So we can say that d is, of course, going to have a component in the normal direction. I'm going to call that component dn um, times it by the uh, unit normal. And because t is perpendicular, n and t are linearly independent vectors. And so um, we can say those in general are going to be uh, some component in the tangent direction as well. So d subscript t in the t direction. So what we've done there is split the vector d up into its components parallel and um, perpendicular to the surface of reflection. So what about d prime? Well, if you think about it, all that's happened is that the vertical part of d has been flipped because it was coming down, then it's going up, um, and the tangential component hasn't changed at all by the reflection. So reflection has the effect of flipping the normal component. And so we could write d prime as minus dn n hat um, plus dt t hat to show that the normal component has been flipped. Now we don't really care about the tangent component. We'd rather have d prime expressed in terms of uh, the original d vector and n alone. Fortunately we can do that pretty easily using the equation on the line above and just rearrange that equation to get uh, dt t hat equals d minus dn uh, n hat and so we substitute that in we get um, that d prime is minus dn n hat plus d minus dn n hat right where that entire bit is really just the tangential component then of course you can just combine some of the terms and get d minus 2 dn 
n hat. So this is good because we now have a relation between the incoming vector d and the reflected vector uh, d prime that only depends on the normal vector to the parabola. Now we can use vector notation to take that a little bit further and use uh, the dot product. Um, so specifically, it's going to be d prime equals d minus two times. Uh, if we want the component of d in the n direction, we just have to dot d with the n hat vector like that. So minus two d dot n hat times n hat. And one other useful thing to do is to generalize this to the case where n is not necessarily normalized. Um, and so uh, we just use the fact that n hat is some unnormalized um, n vector divided by its own magnitude, right? So if we do that, uh, we get d minus 2 um, d dot n hat, where we're not, sorry, not n hat, but just n, where we're not assuming that this is normalized anymore. Uh, this is then going to need to be divided by the magnitude of n to normalize it. And then you've got your n vector here, which again, we're not assuming is normalized. So we divide by the modulus of n again, and we get n squared there. So this is a nice general expression for d prime in terms of d without even assuming that the normal vector has been normalized. So how does this apply to this particular problem? Well, the, the uh, vector d, as we alluded to earlier, um, we can just take as minus one zero, right? Because the incoming ray is going to the left, doesn't have a y component. Um, we may as well normalize it. Uh, it doesn't really matter because we only care about the direction, not the length, right? Um, so the main question then is going to be what is n because we need to know n uh, in order to get d prime and know where the reflected ray goes. Now we can get n from the implicit equation of the parabola y squared equals 4ax. Um, we can first differentiate that to find the gradient of the curve. I'm actually going to differentiate with respect to y get dx by dy um, and First, we're going to divide both sides by 4a, so there's going to be a 1 over 4a. Then you differentiate y squared with respect to y, you just get 2y. And so that dx by dy is just y over 2a. Now, what does that have to do with the normal n? Well, if you think of the normal vector as being a line segment, then it has a gradient, right? And we can use that dx by dy uh, to figure out the gradient of n. Um, because it is perpendicular to the curve, right? Because it's a normal. Um, we can use the rule for gradients of perpendicular lines and say that the gradient of that vector, the line segment defined by the vector, is minus one over the gradient of the curve, which is dy by dx. Um, and this, of course, is just the same as minus dx by dy. And so the gradient of the normal vector is minus uh, y over Two a. Note, by the way, that when I say gradient, I don't mean the vector calculus operator of gradient. I guess depending on where you are in the world, maybe you're more used to calling that slope. And so when I say gradient, I really mean the slope of that line segment. Now let's also say that our original ray is coming in with some fixed y value of k, just to emphasize that that's a constant. And then so the, the gradient of the normal at that particular point where the ray intersects the curve is going to be minus uh, k divided by 2a. Now, we can then go straight to writing down a possible n vector. Um, remember that the gradient just tells you about uh, the change in y divided by the change in x. And so you can interpret the bottom of that fraction as a change in x and the top, or the minus k, as being a change in y. And so your n vector, because we don't care about the normalization, could just be 2a and then minus k. How do I know that it's 2a minus k instead of minus 2a and then k? Well, you can just get that from the diagram. You can kind of see that it, in this configuration, if k is positive, then we want n to be pointing sort of down and to the right. So the y coordinate, sorry, the y component should be negative. So let's plug in n and d into our d prime formula that we've got up at the top there and see what we get. So d prime is going to be, firstly, you've got d, which is minus one, zero. Then we're subtracting all of that stuff. So minus two times the dot product of this and this, which is simply minus 2a because d has a y component of zero. So the dot product bit is just minus 2a. Uh, then we've got magnitude squared of n. That's just the sum of squares of the components, which is 4a squared 
plus k squared, and then we've got our n vector, 2a minus k. Um, I'm just going to simplify that second term a tiny bit and write it as minus 1, 0 plus 4a uh, over 4a squared plus k squared, um, 2a minus k, just tidying up those minus signs a bit. So I think we've now done most of the hard work because we have a vector that tells us where the reflected ray is going. Uh, I think the clearest way to see where the ray ends up crossing the x-axis is to uh, get the Cartesian equation of that red line in my diagram. So um, I'm going to write down, let's first think about the gradient. So I'm going to write down reflected gradient, meaning the gradient of that reflected ray, the red line. Um, again, just using the fact that gradient is change in y over change in x. The change in y from that vector, because this bit is just 0, um, you're getting a change in y uh, from the y component of the second term, and of course including that constant there. I think I need to make a bit more space. So let's say the reflected gradient is you are going to get um, minus 4ak divided by 4a squared plus k squared, right? That's the y component of that d prime vector. Uh, we divide by the x component, change in x, uh, which is going to be, you're going to get 8a squared from 4a into 2a, so 8a squared, again over 4a squared plus k squared, and then don't forget this minus 1 from that first term there. Now we've got fractions within fractions, so we're going to multiply top and bottom of the overall fraction by 4a squared plus k squared. That's going to give you simply minus 4ak on the top. On the bottom, you will get 8a squared, but you'll also get minus 4a squared minus k squared. So the 8a squared minus 4a squared gives you 4a squared. And then you've got k squared like that, minus k squared. So that's the gradient of the red line. Then we can use that to get the equation of the red line. Uh, we can use the standard formula, y minus y1 is mx minus x1, where x1 and y1 are the coordinates of a particular point, any point that the line goes through. Um, we know m, m is just the gradient, it's the expression we just derived, so this gives y minus, what should we use for y1? Well, we know the red line goes through that point where the incoming ray uh, hits the parabola. We know that it has a y coordinate of k, because that's what we said the y coordinate is. So y minus k equals, um, then all of that stuff, minus 4ak over 4a squared minus k squared, x minus something, and the x coordinate can be obtained from the equation of the parabola. x is just y squared divided by 4a, y is k, and so it's minus k squared um, divided by 4a. So there's the equation of the reflected ray. Um, to figure out where it cuts the x-axis, all we have to do is set y to 0. Um, if that happens, um, then this y disappears. Uh, you can cancel this minus k with the minus k on the other side, multiply both sides by 4a squared minus k squared over 4a, and get 4a squared minus k squared over 4a um, is equal to x minus k squared over 4a. Notice that there is a minus k squared over 4a there, and also there, so that cancels from both sides. You are left with x equals 4a squared divided by 4a, which is of course just a, and so we have concluded that the reflected ray goes through the point um, a0, which was exactly the property that we we're trying to prove, right? So any ray coming in parallel to the x-axis is going to be reflected through the focus, which is quite an interesting and maybe unexpected property. And this property does have some real-world applications. For example, uh, if you want to make a telescope and make sure that all of the incoming light from a particular star or object that you're looking at um, is focused onto a single point, then a parabola might be a good shape to make your uh, the mirror of your, your telescope out of, um, or the reflecting surface of your telescope out of. Uh, you could also use it the opposite way. If you want to create a highly collimated beam, in other words, uh, a beam whose edges are sort of parallel to each other, you could put a point source of light at the focus, use the, the same argument in reverse and say that any ray coming from the focus will be reflected so that it's going parallel to the x-axis, right? So um, you could you could put a point source there and get a, a collimated source. So there are some, some applications of this and what I hope was an interesting proof. So thank you for watching and see you soon.